Over the years, it, it happened quite often that students brought to a lesson a work by Debussy or Ravel, and they were very proficient with their fingers, but you could tell that there was no gestalt that informed their playing, that there was no real understanding of period, of what went on in the world of painting, in the world of poetry at the same time. So uh, I, I hope that all, those of you who are mu young musicians here will come back from this talk, especially if we get the, the pictures on, with some new ideas about how to approach this music and how to translate certain colors and impressions on the canvas to your instrument. So we are talking here about another French revolution that took place at the end of the 19th century in which poets, painters, and composers stormed the barricades together and whose aftermath is still with us today, all the way till the present time. Until then, it was Vienna, which was the undisputed capital of musical life in Europe. Mozart, Beethoven, later on Brahms, Schubert, Schumann. These were its revered demigods. With the arrival of the 20th century, Vienna was gradually becoming a museum of itself, sort of a, a haven for sentimentality and marzipan lovers. And Paris emerged as a successor with a frenzy of artistic activities, vitality, impressionism, cubism, theater, dance, and an astonishing number of superb composers. Fauré, Debussy, Ravel, Stravinsky, later on a group of six composers who called themselves Les Cis, the, the six, including Darius Mio, Onegir, <laughs> Germaine Taifer, Taifer, a woman composer, Poulenc, and they all gathered around Cocteau. It was a, a fascinating group of people. They were all determined. This is surreal, isn't it? They were all determined to create a new non-German sound. It also became a haven, I mean, a, a destination for young American composers flocked to Paris to study with the great Nadia Boulanger at the time. She was a great musical pedagogue. And th that was Copland and Bernstein and Virgil Thompson. Even Philip Glass. Even Philip Glass went there to absorb this new wave. And this is the debt we have, we owe, to French culture of this, this era. American sound in music is very much in debt, indebted to this period. When Debussy said that Wagner's music was not a great sunrise, but a magnificent sunset. He didn't know how profoundly prophetic his words were. Wagner's grand operas were a swan song to German romanticism. They dead ended with Mahler's symphony and finally exploded into the smithereens of Schoenberg's 12 tones. From this point on, it was the French who opened the door to modernism, rejecting the ponderous, probing musical language and the solid architecture of the German tradition, the somber browns and sort of dusty gold of the academy, painters, letting in the fresh winds of Impressionism with its hazy, outdoors, pastel colors. 
Rather than create music that was locked into a firm structure, sonata form, symphony, music that had a sense of a fixed permanence, sort of a monolithic grandeur, these composers and painters were obsessed with the fleeting, the impermanent, the suggestive, the elusive, the vague. To quote Monet, the instability of the universe transforms itself minute by minute before our eyes. This explains why he was compelled to return to the same haystacks. Do we have haystacks, finally? Give us another haystack, Jadzer. Give us another haystack. OK. Obsession. Um, the Cathedral at Rouen. All right. The Cathedral at Rouen. Before dawn, at high noon, at dusk time, with the changing seasons, constantly returning and trying to recreate, re-experience the very same thing. He would say, yes, bien sûr, I painted it already. But this was in the morning. It's very different now. This was the mentality. His repeated representations were an attempt to transform a static art into one of fluency, to transform painting into music, while Debussy was transforming sounds into pictures, into paintings. The evolution of the two art forms has run a parallel course for centuries. At the same time that composers in the early Renaissance began to show awareness of tonality, constructing a piece of music with a central key, C major, D major, with a harmonic sense of direction, goal, painters like Giotto began to discover perspective I know somebody in this room will disagree with me. We have Paul Chaloff here who actually gave a lecture showing that the cave paintings in, in France 24,000 years ago, 30,000 years ago, already there was some awareness of perspective. But as far as we Westerners are concerned, this was the parallel evolution. And the painters painter in, of Giotto's generation were struggling to figure out the rules that governed perspective. There are a lot of drawings showing that. So the two concepts, tonality and perspective, have gone hand in hand ever since. And when around 1900, the Impressionists began to abandon the illusion of depth in the paintings, the illusion of third dimension, and rather stress the surface of the canvas, when the tables and still lifes in Cezanne. Oh, OK, these are the lilies. We, we jumped, you jumped ahead a little bit. Oh, these are the lilies. I'm sorry, we are going back to the repeated obsessive paintings of the lily pond in the famous. Keep going, Jadze. Give us all the lily ponds. More and more. Yeah, this is the same. OK. When the tables in Cezanne's painting, and later on, Picasso, Braque, Juan Gris, all of them, became distorted, rising to the surface of the canvas, revealing the contents on the table. Two dimensions, right? When there was no longer a symbolic exploration of grandiose historic events, and all that mattered was what met the eye, 
right there on the surface. This was exactly the time when tonality began to disintegrate. And composer Eric Satie, French composer, said that he was writing music with no sauerkraut, mocking the German proclivity for ponderousness, for, for depth. Surface music, two-dimensional, like the shimmering surfaces of Debussy. Let's see some of these. Uh, you see how the tables are rising to the surface of the canvas. There's no longer really a sense of perspective. There is Brack, a beautiful Brack. All the same motif, table, but lifted towards the surface of it. And there's one more by, there's another Brack. I think we have one Greece too, there. It's a charming composition. In this shift from Romanticism to Modernism, music and painting were more closely linked than during any other period in history, in subject matter, in treatment, and in artistic goals. As the two Claudes, Claude Monet and Claude Debussy, will now demonstrate. Here are a few titles of Debussy's musical compositions. You cannot get more visual than that. The first is, he calls them images, which is very much a visual term. Images, image. One is reflection on the water, reflet dans l'eau. Thank you. Both he and Ravel exploited the qualities of the piano to create this, to conjure up this vision of fluidity and luminosity, of the way light plays on the water. La mer, of course, the, the sea. This is an orchestral piece, but can you give us the theme of la mer? Looking for it. You're looking for it. OK, it's not that, that important. I'm sure everybody knows the piece. The work was inspired, by the way, not by the way, the work was inspired by a painting, The Great Wave of Kanagawa, by the famous Japanese painter Hokusai. And this is a picture we have to see. This is the piece of painting that created Debussy's great La Mer. You can even see Mount Fuji in the background, between the waves. Uh, it's, it's a little small, but it looks like a little pyramid there in the center. All right? So people chided Debussy for composing La Mer, his great oceanic score, without a visit to the sea. And his reply was, I have innumerable memories, and those are worth more than a reality, which tends to weigh too heavily on the imagination. How wonderful, how wonderful. There's an inner world that is more powerful, more convincing, more real than what's out there. That's Debussy. Nocturne. Debussy did very little to discourage comparisons between his nocturnes and nocturnes in paint by James Whistler. Same time, Whistler, it's an English name, but he was pretty much a French painter. He lived both sides of the canal. Let's hear a little bit of Debussy's nocturnes and look at the same time at some paintings by Whistler called This is a Nocturne by Whistler.
Thank you. This is really Debussy in pigment. It was Monet who said, without the fog, London would not be beautiful. <laughs> Another set of pieces is a tamp, print. Another visual term from the world of painting. Two of them, uh, maybe Mikhail can demonstrate. One is pagod, pagodas. And the other one, Jardin sur la pluie, uh, gardens in the rain. Both of those pieces are inspired, or actually a transcription, of Javanese dance music. Another piece, Mist, Bruvial, Mist. Another one, Clouds, Nuage. Do you have Nuage in your fingers? Yes, no. Okay, not important. How about Poisson d'or, goldfish. That's interesting. Goldfish was inspired again by a little Japanese lacquer painting that Debussy owned. And I think we have here. Here it is. This little lacquer Japanese painting. Thanks. So, and so on and so on. You can see, I think the point is very clear, that this man is living in a visual world, pretty much his own interpretation of the visual world. Looking at this list, you would assume you were viewing a catalog of art exhibit, not a, a works of, of music. Gauguin said, color is vibrations, just as music is. And I'm sure that all these guys would concur. This preference for sensual fantasy over reality permeates his sounds. When asked in an que official questionnaire where he would like to live, Debussy replied, out of the world. His prelude, à la pré, la pré, uh, the prelude à l'après-midi d'un fond, the afternoon of a fawn, is such an intoxication with sound and the world of sensuality. It's a drama of the imagination and it was a collaboration of all the arts inspired by an erotic poem by Stéphane Mallarmé set in the bucolic sensuality of Greek antiquity, and eventually choreographed by Nijinsky in the Ballet Russe in Paris, and with stage design, backdrops, and costumes designed by Leon Baxt, the great Leon Baxt. Uh, it was a sensational success and a scandal, of course, when it was premiered. Uh, why don't we see some of those? Uh, okay, this is the poster of Leon, Leon Baxt for La Premédie d'Enfant. I 
I'm sure you're all familiar with this haunting. It's the flute, the beginning of the piece, flute alone. Thank you, Mikhail. So, the entire piece is hovering between reality and fantasy, like the satyr who wakes up from his afternoon nap on a rock in the middle of the woods, wondering if the erotic encounter he had with three forest nymphs was real or imaginary. We have a few rare pictures of Nijinsky himself dancing La Pemidi with the, the designs of Leo Bax. Let, Leo Bax let, let's look at a few of those. Amid this artistic ferment, the challenge to academic traditions and norms, the rebellion against the German hege hegemony in the world of music, the international exhibition opened in Paris, the Exposition Universelle. It was 1889, and France was celebrating it the centenary of the French Revolution. The Eiffel Tower was erected, and along the Seine River, there were pavilions from far away exotic countries or exotic lands. Gauguin was there watching Javanese dancers, sketching Cambodian sculptures which he compared favorably to Botticelli's frescoes. Ravel, a kid of 14, was roaming the grounds and like Debussy, was fascinated by the sounds of Indonesian gamelan orchestras, African, Hungarian, Japanese, Vietnamese music. There was a, a feverish sense of excitement to it all. The beginning of world music. The awareness of other worlds of beauty and complexity. Debussy felt that the Javanese counterpoint made Palestrina sound like a child's play. And the refined percussion of the Japanese ensembles, the gong, the cymbals, flutes, made Western percussion sound like the barbarous noise of a traveling circus. Now this is a transformation of a man who grew up in Paris. Maurice Ravel would continue this modern revolution deeper into the 20th century Debussy died in 1918 on the eve of the First World War. Ravel lived until 1937. His music does not lend itself so readily to visual metaphor. And it doesn't show the same fascination, the same interest in the visual arts. We can safely say that he started out as an impressionist and then worked his way to post-impressionist era, his texture has the brilliance of enamel rather than the twilight softness, the gauziness of Debussy. His works are intricate jewels where strict control of form and detail keeps raw emotions in check, a little bit like Stravinsky. Being forever the outsider, his father was Swiss, his mother was Basque from the north of Spain. He seems to find comfort in an, in an anchor, emotional anchor, in past forms. 
many of his works appear as modern reminiscences of bygone times. Pavan, the 16th century uh, Spanish court dance, Le Tombeau de Couperin, to Couperin's tomb, Passacaglia. If Debussy goes hand in hand with Monet, I would pair Ravel with Gustave Moreau, the symbolist whose subjects are drawn from archaeology, mythology, evocative, remote, mysterious, dreamlike. Let's look at some. Oh, here it is. I wish we had larger pictures, but there is Moreau. There's another Moreau there. Ravel was the greatest orchestrator of all times. You're all familiar with Mussorgsky's pictures in exhibition, which he took from the piano version and turned into a, an amazing masterpiece, orchestral masterpiece. Here again, we have a connection between the French and the Russian, by the way, which is the theme of our festival this year. His most popular piece, Bolero, is a testament to his genius as an orchestrator. You have here a low brow, cabaret fantango, that repeats endlessly with no thematic development, no harmonic development, in a steady crescendo. The only thing that keeps the interest and the mesmeric attention of the audience is his stupendous orchestration and instrumental coloring. He once confided to Onegger, his fellow composer, I've written only one masterpiece, Bolero. Unfortunately, there is no music in it. <laughs> his wry comment, remark, apart, it was a prophetic work, anticipating minimalism 50 years before before Philip Glass, before this whole group of minimalists. Both Ravel and Debussy radically changed the way music is composed and heard. And the legacy is all around us today in film music, concerts, stage, everywhere. They were the pioneers of cultural pluralism and cross-cultural fertilization. Ravel was a great jazz fan. He would come to, to the States and straight off the boat, he would go to hear Art Tatum in the jazz club. The, Art Tatum was one of his heroes. They were the first major European composers to recognize extra European musical cultures, turning the 20th century into a musical, great musical adventure. Their revered teacher was Gabriel Fauré, the three of them overlap. Debussy's wife, Emma, had been Foray's mistress, and had the two of them had daughters with the same woman. How much more French do you get? <laughs> so I think we should conclude this presentation with an homage to these great painters of dreams by a short piece by Foray, A Present Rêve, After the Dream. Thank you.